For watching the ACS library. My name is Kyle and I aim to help you prepare for the private pilot checkride for free in just five minutes a day. In today's video we will discuss altitude selection, accounting for terrain and obstacles, glide distance of the airplane, VFR cruising altitudes, and the effect of wind. We will use a VFR sectional chart or a terminal area chart for the purposes of this video. I will provide links in the description. Beginning with terrain and obstacles, the minimum safe altitudes are defined in FAR 91-119. According to the regulation, unless taking off or landing, no person may operate over congested areas of cities, towns, settlements, or any open air assembly of persons at an altitude below 1,000 feet above the highest obstacle within a horizontal radius of 2,000 feet of the aircraft. A common misconception is that the yellow areas on the sectional depict congested areas while non-yellow depicts non-congested. This is not necessarily true. Yellow depicts heavily populated areas and the pattern the lights will make as you look down from the aircraft at night. Yellow areas are usually congested, however, being outside of the yellow does not guarantee a minimum safe altitude below 1,000 feet. Over other than congested areas, the pilot must maintain an altitude of 500 feet above the surface, except over open water or sparsely populated areas. In these cases, the aircraft may be operated lower than 500 feet from the surface, but may not be operated closer than 500 feet to any person, vessel, vehicle, or structure. At a minimum, we should maintain the minimum safe altitude prescribed by the FAA above all terrain and obstacles along our route. If unsure about obstacle clearance, refer to the maximum elevation figures depicted here and listed in each quadrant of the sectional or tack. Based on our example flight plan from the previous video, our desired cruising altitude would be roughly 5,500 feet MSL. The entire route is at or below 5,000 MSL and will not bring us over any congested areas. Another obstacle to flight might be airspace. We enter Provo's airspace immediately northwest of our departure point. We may contact them on frequency 125.3 prior to entering their airspace. We also see the NSA zone that we plan to overfly. Pilots are requested to avoid altitudes at and below 8,000 feet MSL over this zone, so we must remain at or above 8,001 feet for the time being. While it is perfectly legal to buzz around at 500 feet AGL, in the event of an engine failure, this would not give us much time to react. Which brings us to our next point, glide distance. Altitude selection based on glide distance is very situational, based heavily on terrain and obstacles, aircraft, and pilot skill level. Terrain, obstacles, and aircraft potentially restrict landing availability. A pilot operating a Learjet over the metropolitan area of Manhattan, New York is going to have significantly less landing options available than the Diamond Star pilot in Manhattan, Kansas. Pilot skill level simply determines the time required for the pilot to react appropriately. Pilots in unfamiliar aircraft may want to generously increase cruising altitude beyond the safe glide distance to allow more time to react in the event of an emergency. Your aircraft's glide distance can be calculated using the aircraft's POH. For our example, I'll continue to use a 1978 Cessna 172 November model. Always read the notes before performing any calculations. Our glide distance is found in section 3 of the POH, Emergency Procedures. Once we have found the glide chart and read the notes, we find that, under these conditions at 4,000 feet AGL, we expect a glide distance of approximately 6 miles, or in other words, a mile and a half per thousand feet. The terrain along our route is at and below 5,000 feet, and for the moment, we have selected a cruising altitude of 8,001, or in other words, 3,000 feet above the surface. This translates to 4.5 miles glide distance. Referring again to our Manhattan, New York vs. Kansas example, the terrain and obstructions along this route are pretty similar to that of Manhattan, Kansas. A 4.5 mile glide distance is plenty for us. We will not need to adjust our altitude for glide distance, so we are still settled on a cruising altitude of 8001 in this example. Moving on to VFR cruising altitudes, FAR 91-159 is the law here. This applies to pilots operating above 3,000 feet AGL and below 18,000 feet MSL, while not turning. Below 3,000 feet AGL, altitude is at the pilot's discretion. Above 18,000 MSL, pilots maintain altitudes assigned by ATC. We will take the 360-degree compass 
and split it in half. We will have heading 000 or 360 through 179 on the right and 180 through 359 on the left. If our desired magnetic course falls within the range depicted to the right, the pilot must maintain an odd thousand altitude plus 500 feet. For instance, 3,500 feet, 5,500 feet, and so on. And to the left, pilots must maintain altitudes of even thousand plus 500. 4,500 feet, 6,500 feet, etc. Based on our true course and our nav log, we anticipate that our magnetic course will fall within the category to the left, 180 through 359 degrees, for all but the last heading. That being said, we will adjust our desired altitude to 8,500 rather than 8,001, with a desired altitude 1,000 feet below that for that final leg. Lastly, we move on to the effects of wind on altitude selection. This subject is pretty intuitive. Select altitudes with winds favoring your flight path. Unless you're just building time, select the altitude offering the strongest tailwind and enjoy quicker trips and lower fuel cost. On top of all these considerations, we must consider obstructions to any communication or navigation sources. In our example, the Fairfield VOR that we are planning to use may fall out of line of sight because of these 10,500 foot peaks here. For the purposes of our flight, these VOR cross radials are only supplemental. So while an altitude of 10,500 might offer us better VOR reception, if you prefer to remain at 8,500 for the whole route, that's just fine too. VOR reception in this case is not an absolute necessity for us. We can navigate with or without it. but. Let's go ahead and plan to climb 2,000 feet higher to a cruising altitude of 10,500 rather than 8,500 MSL anyways for this navlog. We'll have a slightly faster true airspeed, and the air conditioning in the Cessna is a little better up at that altitude anyway. Now that all factors are accounted for, we refer to our navlog again. We can transfer the information over to that form now. I will leave the final leg at an altitude of 7,500 and we will discuss this decision in the next video. This concludes today's video over altitude selection based on a few different factors. We will pick up where we left off in our nav log in the next video over calculating time, climb and descent rates, course, distance, heading, and true airspeed and ground speed. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed today's video, I hope that you might like it or share with someone else who may benefit from watching. Remember to subscribe for future videos and don't forget to hit the bell button for notifications. Comments are always greatly appreciated. Thanks again and safe flying.